Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live today. It's Saturday, February 23rd, 2013. Our topic today is Feature Teacher, and it'll be my pleasure in a few minutes to introduce our special guest, Ryan Hong. A uh, little heads up today, Peggy George is involved in facilitating the EdCab Phoenix, so she will not be with us today. So I'll have to pull up her socks and do some uh, additional work because uh, we're going to miss uh, Peggy's work with us tremendously. And, and just a reminder, and thank you again to uh, Lori Moffat, uh, our backup moderator, and uh, Tammy Moore, who will be providing closed captioning for us throughout the show. Um, for those of you people who are new today, I want to talk about how you can uh, keep track of the chat and not worry about what's going on. We have something you may be familiar with, uh, Live Binder, and we have a special one every week. And uh, the links that are being shared and the resources that are going on will be posted in the Live Binder. And Kim just posted the link for us in the chat. Just to give you a heads up, Classroom 20 Live resources are on the bottom of that sidebar. And you're going to find the survey that we're going to talk about a little bit later. And anything that has to do with uh, our website and calendar and uh, additional resources that we have. And it's kind of nice to look at that Live Binder. It's, we now have it set up with uh, tabs on the side of the screen. So in addition to the Live Binder, we have another way of keeping track of everything that we do. And we have a website, live.classroom20.com. And we always point you to the Archives and Resources page because we post, again, the same links that are in the Live Binder, a link to the Live Binder. We have a direct link to a recording of today's session in Blackboard Collaborate. We have an MP3 file and an um, embedded movie file. So what else? Am I and the chat log, which is really important because sometimes if you, a link went by and you missed it, don't worry about it. You'll be able to catch up on the chat log because we post that as well. I had something in my head about um, links and chats, but it'll come back later because I can't remember at the moment. But I think that's a really good overview of how you uh, yourself can review a recording or if you really think that uh, one of your um, uh, what do you want to <laughs> your compatriots? I can't have a good word for it. People that you work with, word's gone. Anyway, someone who wasn't able to attend the show, you felt there was great value of it. Please direct them back to our website for all the resources that are there. So I asked you to be a participant. Most people know how to do this, so you need to take the laser pointer, the second uh, tool down on the left, on the left of your screen, and show us where you are located in the world. So let's see those starburst laser pointers all over the world. And uh, if that's not working, please just type in the chat where you are from. I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario. And Orion is in Vancouver, BC. Central Pennsylvania for Lori. You know, um, Kim is in San Antonio, Texas. So right away, we have a good spread across the world. And uh, I know someone was in Belarus. I know that uh, Thailand Shambles was with us today. So it is a great to see the connections that we have across the world. So I'm going to make you work a little bit harder now. I have some poll questions. Remember where that poll icon is? It's just below your name, the one on the right. Click on it and answer a question today. Number one is, do you use social networks to build community with your students and parents. So yes, if you do, and no, if you don't. And in just a minute, I will collect all the votes, and then Ryan can see the answers. Give him a sense of uh, the audience and their um, previous knowledge or experiences, which we're more than happy to have them share in the chat. I think that was the one thing I missed about the chat information is um, if you have a link or something that's appropriate to the day's session, we will add that to uh, the blog post as well as the live binder so everything gets caught. So let's take a look at the results of that vote. It shows me that uh, about 45% are using social networks to build uh, communities with their students and parents. It's terrific information. Let's go to poll question number two. Do you maintain a class, website, or blog? So yes, if you do, no, if you don't. So we're getting a lot of the votes here, so let me publish the results. 
Yes, to do. Over 60% of our participants today are using a class blog or website. Let's go on to poll question number three now. Do you have a blended classroom, in-class, mobile, e-learning? So yes, if you do, no, if you don't. Votes are coming in quickly. Let's see what the results say. I think we have a bit of a split here, not too far off. And I'm just losing my voice just a second, excuse me. Right back at you. So 40, 35 more people than not are using blended classrooms. So I want to clear the results and let's go to our last poll question, number four. Do you use the big six practices of assessment for learning? So this may be a, a, a little bit more no because um, Ryan's going to have to give us an outline of what exactly the big six practices are. Publish the book. Oh, I hit the wrong button. I think it was 14 to 8 for uh, use of the big six practices. So Ryan, you're going to know right away that people are going to enjoy uh, your um, information about that. So again, it's uh, time to go on to our show. And thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Again, our topic is Feature Teacher. And we're really pleased that uh, Ryan could be with us today. Um, I have to say another Canadian add to the list. And uh, we're very appreciative of him being able to take time because he is already um, busy as an intermediate teacher, grade 6 and 7, at an education technology specialist at Hillcrest Elementary School in Surrey, BC. He has taught for approximately 11 years, and his philosophy is based a lot on these big six uh, assessment learning practices. He has been recommended today uh, by Betty Fay, who I believe Betty is in the chat. We thank you very much for uh, adding uh, Ryan to our, our list of again, great featured teachers. And some of the things that she was really happy about was the fact that he writes a classroom blog daily to inform parents that uh, he uses media and technology to increase student engagement. He works with Walwish or Skype and so on. And I'm going to let Ryan explain that. And turn the microphone over to Ryan. And if you have some more uh, thoughts you would like to add to uh, your background, Ryan, please feel free to do so. We're very pleased that you could be with us today. So the microphone is now yours. The uh, forward and back buttons for your slides. Oh yes, Kim's reminding me. In the introduction, we do put you to a test. And if you don't move the slides, I'm sorry, I keep on forgetting. So part of your introduction has to always also respond as the featured teacher. What does Web 2.0 mean to you? And why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Sorry about that. But Ryan, the microphone's yours. Go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction. This is very new to me. I um, haven't done a webinar like this before, so bear with me in case uh, I make some errors along the way, and I guess we can learn together. Um, so the newbie question here, what does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Um, Web 2.0 to me uh, includes basically the entire Internet and mainly the technologies out there that actually facilitate the learning um, of your students and of everyone uh, who's using it to learn new things. Um, let me just go on to the next slide here. I just got a picture. Um, so most people just look at Web 2.0 and I think they think, OK, there's this website I can use, there's that website, and this might help me in this way. And sometimes I think, they lose sight of the learning, and they're always focused on, OK, this is a fun thing to use. Let's do this. Um, the way that I like to look at it is I want to use a technology out there in my classroom that's going to help my students learn how to learn. Um, so I like to reinforce the four C's of 21st century learning. Um, and for the Americans who are listening in on today's webinar, um, AFL, Assessment for Learning, is more of a Canadian term 
for a formative assessment, and I'll be getting in, into a little bit more detail about that uh, in just a few moments. Um, you know, like the choice that it offers uh, students uh, whenever they're doing a creation, whenever they're creating a project or um, creating criteria, giving feedback, they have all these different options that they can choose from. Um, which helps streamline the learning process and keeps them engaged. And I'm sure all of you have seen in your classrooms how engaged the students are when they are using these Web 2.0 uh, apps or tools and technology. Um, so the formatting looks like it's uh, been thrown off a little bit here. Um, this slide should show that just a uh, bunch of different types of Web 2.0 apps that you can find online. Some of you may be familiar with some of them. You may use them in your classrooms. Uh, you can't see all the ones that I had listed here, but I could just uh, list off some of them. Weebly, todaysmeet.com, Google Drive, uh, Google Plus, wallwisher.com, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, any sort of social media out there. Uh, and in our class, I like to use uh, Google Drive for the students' working portfolios, and then they use their Weebly sites. Each of them have an individual website where they actively blog and post reflections on their learning and uh, include any projects or presentations that they've done in the past. Um, and Google Drive is one of the, I guess, uh, more important ones that we use in class because they can use it to streamline almost everything. Um, some other th technologies out there that we've been using include Apple TV, Photo Stream to build the community within the classroom, uh, and all the other ones that you guys are all familiar with, from MacBooks to projectors, dock cameras, iPods, iPads, all of those things. So just a little bit about my teaching practice. Um, everyone's aware of uh, the shift in education and how more teachers are becoming the facilitators and activators of student passions really in learning. Uh, this is what I try to model to my students uh, instead of being, I guess, what I grew up with in elementary school would have been more of a passive way of learning where the teacher was at the front of the classroom giving us the information and feeding it to us, and we were expected to eat that up and kind of regurgitate that onto a test or uh, some sort of summative assessment. Um, I like to keep a happy medium between skills and knowledge, um, and those skills being the four C's of 21st century learning, uh, communication, critical thinking, uh, collaboration, and creativity. And all those different Web 2.0 apps allow us to do that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little later on. Um, I like having the active learners and having them search out what they want to learn and becoming more active in the learning process itself, which brings us back to uh, the assessment for learning and the formative assessment, which I'll be talking about in just one moment here. So. The 21st century learning skills that I just mentioned, uh, critical thinking, collaboration, communication, creativity, the main app that we like to use in class is Google Drive because it allows for all of this to take place with whatever activities we're doing. Um, the big one I think that we like to uh, promote in the class is collaboration and communication. Um, the students are able to work on any given assignment, group notes, research and work off of the same document from just about anywhere in the world. Um, so if a student's away, they can still participate in the class uh, through mobile or e-learning from their homes. Uh, and it also saves quite a bit of time doing that. And we'll talk a little bit more about blended learning later. So this is just a wordle that I uh, put together. I threw in a bunch of the technologies that we use in class and different uh, educational terms, and you can see quite clearly that the number one or the number one term that pops up over and over is learning, and I think that's what uh, 
I like to focus on, and it's not. I don't focus on technical skills with technology in my classroom. I, I focus on the learning itself and helping students understand what it takes for them to improve on what they have learned um, through self and peer assessments, reflections, etc. I was introduced to assessment for learning uh, through my current administrator, Ursa Jensen, and she worked for the BC Educational Leadership Council for several years, um, which was part of the Ministry of Education. And she, she introduced this article to the staff which outlines the benefits of incorporating the big six practices of formative assessment and assessment for learning. So if you haven't had a chance to read this document yet, I highly recommend it. Um, it really did open up my eyes to the importance of uh, really feedback and the big six practices. So let's uh, get right into it with the six big practices of formative assessment or assessment for learning as we know it up here. Um, we have clear learning intentions, student generated criteria, quality descriptive feedback asking good questions in self and peer assessment, which all leads to ownership. Um, the first one is quite obvious, and I know that a lot of teachers do already uh, use these practice practices, but some may not use all of them together. And with them, it's almost like a template for learning, where if you do combine them, you will see improvements in student learning. The research clearly shows that uh, learning does increase. Um, so when we set the learning intentions in class, we, we make it obvious. At the onset of the lesson, we tell the students what the purpose is, what they're going to learn, and this helps give them uh, a sense of direction about why they are, why we're doing something. And there's a quote right there that says, it tells me the purpose of what I'm doing. And we hear it over and over and over. And we have taken uh, student satisfaction surveys. And this was, along with feedback, clear learning intentions was one of uh, the factors that they felt helped them learn better. Student generated criteria, um, instead of simply giving the students the criteria of what quality looks like. We like to help the learners, well, work with the learners to establish criteria on what uh, an A quality assignment would look like or how to produce something that would be um, meeting expectations or exceeding expectations. Um, we find this to be more active involvement on their part so that they're thinking critically about, all right, well, this would make this assignment look better. This might be a criteria point that we could use to um, assess an assignment. And we use different uh, websites to do this. Some of you may be familiar with today's meet.com. Very easy website to use. You simply add a, you can simply create a the name of a room right here. It's it's become one of those websites that they use at conferences um, to, I guess, set up a back channel so that people who are watching the workshop or keynote can pop up questions and throw up ideas and get a dialogue going between different uh, people who are participating in the event. Um, so if you haven't Try this out. I highly recommend it. Um, out of all the brainstorming type uh, technologies out there, my students seem to really gravitate towards this one because you're able to see an ongoing uh, stream of the conversation and they can follow it quite easily um, compared to other ones out there. Another one that some of you may be familiar with is Wall Whisper, which is now known as Padlet.com. It's more of a a wall or a cork board that students can stick digital stickies onto does a very similar uh, does a, a similar thing to uh, as today's Meet, 
Um, students do seem to prefer today's meet over this, but they also like to use this when they're um, perhaps doing reading strategies or doing some work with Faye Brownlee's um, reading strategies or um, Adrian Gears or other ones out there. But once you start using these, you, the ideas seem to uh, start coming to you and it falls like dominoes and you start, oh, well, I could use this for criteria, I could use this for giving feedback, oh, maybe we could use it for this. So many ideas that start popping up in your heads once you start using these. Um, the number one part of the big six practices that increases the learning of the students is the feedback and the self-assessment and peer assessment of uh, the students. Um, a lot of research out there from John Hattie and Black and William says that it helps the lower learners increase their amount of learning. It uh, almost doubles once you start incorporating all six practices into your uh, teaching. Um, and it focuses on giving less evaluative feedback and increasing the feedback that's actually going to help them improve their learning um, and not giving, you know, so many, you know, I guess verbal doggy biscuits and saying, oh, good job, great work over here, oh, that's fantastic, but actually giving them suggestions on how they can improve their work and their learning. Um, and oftentimes we'll have students in our class come up to us and say, well, Mr. Hong, you uh, told us that we did a great job. Can you give us a few more suggestions on uh, what we can do to improve our work? And it's, it's amazing to see the ownership that takes place once they become familiar with the, uh, the learning language itself. So this is just a screenshot of my Google Drive, and I just wanted to point out um, that I also use this to keep ongoing anecdotal comments and um, suggestions, feedback, and assessment of my students. Um, so I share these folders with my students and their parents, and they are private just to them so that they can actually see how their students are doing and the students can actually see how they're doing. Um, and I've received some great feedback from parents uh, that it really does give them a better sense of what's going on in their classroom in addition to having the class website uh, because they have a window to look into the classroom whereas before it would be perhaps, you know, one day a term for parent-teacher parent-teacher interviews or something like that. Um, so everything is totally visible to the parents and the students and all stakeholders. Powerful questions is the fourth point. Um, promoting deeper questions that help the students think more critically and help them actually improve on their learning. Um, so there's a quote down there by Smith, it says, four words to improve teaching, talk less, and ask more questions. So what we like to do on our, on our class website where we, the students do written responses on a daily basis, we like to ask the, the students questions that will help them think about the topic deeper and think about other ways that they can look at certain concepts um, or different ways that they could actually improve on their work. And here's just a screenshot of, I guess, Thursdays. Um, I, you could go into the website later on uh, on your own time and see how it works. And it's a very interactive website where we have ongoing dialogue with the students and we give them suggestions on what they can do to improve. Um, and we it, it gives us a much better sense of uh, where they are, especially with their writing. The self and peer assessment is the fifth big practice of assessment for learning. Um, give, if the students have a supportive, collaborative environment to learn in, the scaffolding 
that takes place is absolutely amazing. And you see the students taking more ownership of their learning. They're able to identify uh, areas where their peers need to improve on, and then those students are then able to act on on uh, the suggestion uh, for improvement. And Android said if students can produce it, they can assess it. If they can assess it, they can improve it. And it, it does take time for the students to become comfortable with this process. Um, but oftentimes they'll ask Mr. Hong, are we going to do our self-assessments now, or are we going to do our peer assessments? So they're already kind of familiar with the, the template for learning, as I like to call it. Um, it is absolutely amazing um, what you see happen with your students after you start incorporating the six practices of assessment for learning. Um, and I really do have to thank Ursa Jensen for uh, really being my teacher as a teacher. And here's a screenshot from our Instagram account of a student who's doing some oral language um, assessments for one of his assignments here, and he's just using two iPads to do that, one to record video of him speaking, and the other to jot down some notes on what he can do to improve on his own work. And incorporating all five of the ones that I just mentioned hopefully ends up with a student owning their learning. Um, having the students able to articulate what they did to reach where they are at a given point and what they have to do to improve on that is absolutely amazing to see when they are able to accomplish that. Um, they're able to say, tell us where their strengths are, what they need to get better, and what the next step is. Um, and this is all based on Black and Williams studies uh, and the BC Educational Leadership Councils. Here's an example of where some of my students show their learning. Um, this is a screenshot of our eFolios pages, and you can access this through our class page. Um, I, just, I just saw a comment pop up in the stream. Um, my class isn't one-to-one. -one. We do have quite a few resources, but we do not have 24-7 uh, access to them. However, we also do have uh, bring your own device a bring your own device policy at our school um, that allows the students to take out their devices when they need it and put it away when they don't. And because of all the citizenship or digital citizenship that we have gone over with the students at the beginning of the year, it seems to have led to uh, positive things coming out of it and very few incidences where we've actually had to take away their technology. Um, and just to add to that, I, uh, one of my students received a uh, Samsung Galaxy for Christmas, and he was always on it while I was doing a read aloud in class uh, over the last couple of months. And I remember thinking to myself that he's got to be playing the game. Um, but then one day I just kind of gently glanced over to see what he was doing, and he was very engaged in what we were doing, and he was looking up terms. He was adding to his notes from his mobile device. Um, and it, Things like that are always happening. Um, Kim, I just saw something pop up from you. Yeah, um, I can share these, I guess, uh, later on after the presentation. Or if you can, if you email me, I can send them directly to you. Um, the easiest way would probably be through Google Drive, and I could just uh, share them to you if you have a Gmail address. So if you do get the chance, take a look at some of these e-folios. I, I have some from the year before posted on there as well. Um, and you can see where they have gone and how they keep evolving over time. Uh, one great thing about them is it's basically a archive of student work, especially writing. And if I look at some of my students from last year who were in grade six, 
and where they've come now, I, I brought, I had the grade sixes down grade seven. The writing has changed dramatically because of um, what they've been doing, and they've been blogging on a regular basis, using their reading strategies and writing strategies. Um, so if you go back to November of let's say 2011, and then look at that same student's work today, uh, it's there's a clear difference, and I attribute a lot of that to the assessment for learning practices uh, that I've incorporated. Um, so with our blogging website, we uh, like to do a lot of the self and peer assessment as well um, for some of the more detailed written response questions. Um, so that brings me to the aspect of the term of blended learning. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. And blending learning really is all about learning in the classroom, e-learning, and learning on the go with a mobile device. Um, and aspects of the flipped classroom lead into this as well, as you can see. Uh, and I'll get a little bit more into that in a second. It allows me to go deeper and cover more topics with the students, whereas before I wouldn't be able to cover everything I needed to in the same amount of time. So it does streamline the learning process even further. Um, it's very personalized for the students. And again, it reinforces those 21st century skills. I just saw a comment pop, pop up of uh, publishing your work to the world. Um, just to add to that, the, the confidence that some of the students gain from showing their work and showing their quality of work has been amazing. And some of, some of my students really shine online, whereas in class they might not be that student who's extroverted and you know contributes to the class discussions as much in person. Um, but when they get online, they're able to come out of their shell and contribute uh, even more. And the other students see this as well. So here's a couple of screenshots of some, my kids doing their work. Um, it, it, it looks like we are one-to-one, -one, but I assure you we are not. Um, One thing about uh, having a class website is you, you're able to see a lot of the statistics and analytics that go into it. And one of the major ones, and actually the most surprising ones to me, uh, was the one that shows me where all my traffic's coming from and the percentage of students who are accessing it, the website and posting from their mobile devices. And I think the last I checked, it was up near 75 to 80 percent of my students are doing their blog responses or posting to their websites from a mobile device, which was uh, an interesting statistic to see. Um, some other things that I'm able to see is the amount of student engagement. Uh, and from the beginning of the year, it's gradually, gradually been increasing. Uh, so I would say that the engagement is at about 23 minutes, 23 and a half minutes uh, per visitor which does go up and down, um, especially during winter break and spring break. So I've gone through quite a few of my slides uh, a little bit quickly. So I, I'd like to answer a few questions before I get into the video that will conclude my presentation. Um. Okay, super. Let me go ahead and give Sarah the mic. Okay, Sarah, you have the mic. Okay, I'm just wondering about your that blended learning um, model. It's where it came from, um, and also if you're going to share your uh, your permission forms at the end. Um, I'll, is my mic on? I think it is. Um, I'll share all my permission forms with you. I've got it on my computer at school or flash drive. Um, I should have it in my drive as well, my Google Drive. Simply just email me. Um, I could add it to the live binder as well. We have 
this question pops up a lot and a lot of especially in Canada with the privacy legislation <laughs> a lot of people are concerned well if you have your students using all these different technologies how are you doing this um, when a lot of user agreements prohibit uh, students under the age of 13 from using them um, and we have a meeting at the beginning of the year with all the parents um, in our gym and we have five, six, seven classes and they all come in and we have a presentation. Um, we have a presentation that we give to them to talk about citizenship and proper use and to answer any questions that they may have and there were quite a few uh, especially because most parents are concerned with what their students are doing online. Um, but in my class, I think I only had one student who was not allowed to have their face and name uh, uh, posted anywhere online. But all the other uh, parents were all for having their students use Gmail and Weebly, eFolios, Instagram, and all these things that would facilitate the learning of the students. I uh, just saw a question go by. Um, I, at the beginning of the year, I asked my parents to create the Gmail accounts with the students um, and so that they have access to it 24-7. If your school is using Google Apps for Education, then you have total control over uh, all the accounts. And so all of our students use their Gmail addresses to sign up for any Web 2.0 technology out there. Uh, and they never associate their real, real first name and last name, so they all sign up under an assumed name. For example, Mickey Mouse, Katniss Everdeen, um, Rainbow Dash. Um, we are not e using Google Apps for Education uh, through a subscription. Um, it's something we're looking into for next year. We've just had the students uh, sign up with their parents. I'm just going to interrupt for a second, Ryan. Laurie, uh, have you had a chance to uh, compile any more questions for Ryan? I only have a couple, Lorna, and that's because Ryan's answered most of them. Uh, let me look at my list. Um, let's see. Um, Someone did have a lengthy question about Google Drive, and I think a lot of the questions embedded in this were answered, but I'll read it anyway. Uh, does anyone have a problem with Google Drive? I use Google Drive for a variety of things. Sometimes on a forum, I make okay. it so students have to use district logon, so I click, click that option, but then some students aren't able to access. Uh, I get an email that someone needs permission. I don't want to have to, I don't want to, have to do that. What if I'm? What am I doing wrong? If that makes sense. So how do students access um, the Google when Drive? When you share app? a document on Google Drive, you have to share it individually to each of the students, and then they can access it. Whereas if you want to um, share it openly to uh, the world, really, then you can make it an open link so that anybody can access it. Um, sometimes I have students who forget to actually share it with me before they hand it into our digital hand inbox from our website. And when that happens, then it'll tell me that I don't have permission to access it, and then I have to actually request it from them. Um, so it's important for me to make sure that the students are aware that if you do make it public, it's public. If you simply share it to, a, to an individual person, then it's only shared to that person. And then let's see if I have any others. And I, I can't say enough about, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, Kim or Lorna, if you please can take the hand raise question, and then I'll see if I have any others. Sure. Let me go ahead and give um, my dad the mic. My dad, did you want to just type your question, or did you want to um, access the mic? If so, just raise your hand again. We'll give you the mic. Okay. Hi, I'm I'm in BC as well, and I'm I'm working toward a global classroom because I think it's important. 
Um, our school district is working towards a portal system, which is uh, Scalantis actually. And I'm just wondering um, if there are any other issues with um, school districts being able to access just about anything that you need to be global without it being limited to a specific list of things. In about a week, I need to go to a meeting that they're asking for that specific list of things you might use. And, and really, for global access and the kinds of things you're talking about, it's, it's more give me access to everything and, and we'll do what we need to do with the students. Is, is, am I in the right place for that question? Or um, can you give me any advice on that? Um, so if I understand your question correctly, you're being, I guess your administrating, administrators are preventing you from accessing certain things or has IT actually put blocks on certain technologies? Actually, we're lucky and right now, no blocks, nothing. And everything is easy to access. But by next year, we're going to be working through a single user interface with a portal system that they want to have standard for all students will see the same thing and all teachers will see the same thing when they go in. So I guess um, I see what you're saying. I'm just wondering. Um, um. I, we have the same in the Surrey School District. Uh, this year they rolled out the Surrey Schools platform, which is uh, uh, Microsoft SharePoint platform, and that might be similar to what you guys are going to be doing. And we've been told by the district that you know we, they want us to use this platform. However, if you have your other ones, let's say, for example, you have a class website on Weebly or WordPress, you're able to link that directly from that profile, let's say your teacher profile or the student profile. Um, I know that with the district platform, when students are blogging and things like that, you can actually set it to be totally private. Um, and I'm not quite sure if they have actually changed the setting to make them public. Um, but I like to use a public platform just so that the students can have a wider audience, which is, I think, what you're looking for because you're looking for a global classroom or a flat classroom. I am not required to use SharePoint. Um, I, I do use it, but I don't use it as much as I use all my other things. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Laurie. So did you want to go ahead and have Kim help you with this video? Uh, yes, that'd be there's great. Your, there's your answer, so we're going to turn off our mics now. Ryan, I think it's come to the end for me, and I just didn't ask if that's the same for most people in the session. It was a really good video. And that great show, I said she's following you. I guess there's a chance again, uh, if uh, there were any more questions people wanted to ask um, Ryan, I think we have a question page, do we? Yep. So that uh, this is your opportunity to, again, if uh, you want to share something with us, that's great too. I thought I saw a question, Ryan, about rubrics for Weeblies. I think we have missed that. OK. I wasn't doing very well with the chat window a while ago, so I may have dreamed that one up. If someone did ask that question about rubrics for Weeblies. Mm -hmm. I think the, they were also asking, um, did the students have individual blogs that are uh, with individual logins off of Weebly? They do. Um, I have a teacher account, which is a paid account. I think it's $60 a year. Um, and then I have all my students actually create their own accounts with their parents again with those um, assumed Gmail uh, accounts. And then so that I have somewhat control if something inappropriate is posted, I have them add me as a full editor so that I could see uh, their accounts under mine which is what the paid accounts really give you. Um, but that's a, just kind of a secret of Weebly that you can use to gain control of something if they uh, post, you know, if they start doing some bullying activities or something online. 
And it's been interesting actually seeing uh, their websites evolve and seeing my grade 7 students from last year who are now in high school continuing to actually blog and post their artwork. Um, and actually some of them are actually selling their work online uh, through different websites. How often do the students blog or post a, a post to their blogs? Um, I don't set any uh, anything firm, so I won't say, okay, you have to post this many things th on this day or by this week or three a week or this. I, I try to have them do it on their own without having me to give them that push. Um, the one thing at the beginning of the year that uh, takes a bit of time to get going is having them blog on our class site on a regular basis. So during the first few weeks they might not all be posting. You know, you will have a few students here and there who don't post every single day, but I'm not so current so concerned with that um, as I am with the quality of the work and if they are actually taking what they've learned in class or outside of the classroom and using that to improve on um, a piece of work that they did in the past. And do you use a rubric to assess those blog posts? Uh, the actual, not the technical side. So for example, if I'm if they did something with reading strategies and blogged about connections, then I might use something that I have uh, for reading strategies to assess their writing piece. Um, I think the real big thing that I've gained as a teacher through reading their responses on a daily basis is I have a, a really good idea where they are uh, in their learning and if they need that extra support. Um, it, it really is amazing because I'm not stuck with carrying, you know, 30 duotangs home every night and reading, for example, writing journals. Um, the class website and their blogs actually, they've really replaced um, that aspect of writing. That's, that's really interesting. Um, somebody asked if you are having your students interact with other classes globally, either via the blog or another way of um, either emailing or something like that? Um, we have done some cross collaboration with other classes. We were uh, part of the Global Read Aloud at the beginning of the year where we were reading the one and only Ivan with, um, we were set up with three different classes across North America. Um, and we did some cross blogging. I'll find that link. I think it's only Ivan.weebly.com is the website I set up, and we're doing some cross blogging with reading strategies. Um, and we also ended up skyping with these classes as well, so the students were able to get that, uh, I guess, digital face-to-face -face interaction with the students and ask questions about what they had read and um, deepen their their thinking, I guess. Um, we're also, uh, we've got some partner classes, uh, one in Singapore and one in the UK that we're hopefully going to start doing some buddy blogging with uh, by the end of the second term, in addition to a couple classes in our Surrey district already. And was that part of the quad, a quad blogging um, activity? Uh, that one itself is not. Um, and we are going to be a part of the quad blogging as well. We just haven't uh, gotten to that point yet. Okay. I was just kind of wondering how you found people to connect with. Oh, through Twitter. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Th so through my personal learning network. Okay, awesome. Brian, I think I'm going to take, take a minute to close out the show because there are some um, announcements we'd like to make, but uh, after I finish the formal um, uh, closing, then uh, please feel free to stay for a few minutes if people still have additional questions. Sure. Just to give you a heads up uh, what's coming up in the next week on Future of Education on Monday, February 25th, we've got Richard Millington talking on social community management, and on the 26th, Gavin Dykes on Student Voice, and 
Also in that week on the Thursday, February 28th, we have Roger Shank talking about teaching minds and how cognitive science can save our schools. And then way into March, we've got uh, a virtual book clubs coming with Ben Rimes. And uh, on the 7th of March, Chris Mergoliano in defense of childhood. Some great opportunities coming up for more learning for ourselves. And uh, for our own shows, we have some uh, another great set of uh, presenters coming for you. Next week marks the second. We have Heidi Williams talking about stretch and scratch. On the 9th of March, we have another featured teacher, Jamie Cook, who's an eighth grade math technology teacher. The 16th of March, we're talking about Guru for Learning with the Guru team. We'll be working on our next topic for the 23rd of March. And just to notice that March 30th, Easter weekend, we won't be having a show. Here's some great information, another learning speaker. Experience. I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to attend next week. Live binders are uh, resurrecting this year. Knowledge sharing webinars. The topic for this one is mapping Common Core state standards and the ELL curriculum. Uh, so that's uh, on. I can't remember which day the 27th is. Someone's going to help me that in the chat. Uh, there we are. The times for PST, five Mountain, six Central, and seven Eastern time. So I look forward to again uh, another great opportunity for you. And just that so you know that we've been a great linkage. Um, the uh, Live Binder people have also given us access to sharing the Live Binders that we have every week. So I know that uh, Betty, she's still with us, uh, used this process of nominating a featured teacher. And we open this up to anyone in the session. When the survey comes up in a few minutes at the end of this show when you exit, then there's your opportunity to fill in um, there as well as let's go back. We actually have a form. And is Kim going to drop the link in for that form? Great. That's the survey one. And we have another one for the featured teachers. So we keep you busy with all kinds of different forms. And please feel free to contact with our any of our email contacts if the forms don't work for you. Uh, another interesting thing, there are a few people I knew that we do have a certificate of participation for each week's show. And you'll complete your application for that certificate on the survey form. And just as a heads up, it's not a formal. We're not giving you the credits for it. You would have to take to your own school board for use of your um, own uh, accreditation. Heads up, we have two uh, ways to collect our shows besides coming to our website and live binders. We have a video and audio collection on iTunes U so that you can subscribe to us every week. Uh, the show archives is another way if you just saw our show today in the blog post. We have a sidebar with all the recordings for the past years. And I can't remember how many it is. Kim will type in the chat with it's four. And so there's an extensive um, amount of resources there as well. Yeah, special thanks today to Ryan for being with us today, taking his time and sharing his expertise. To Steve Hargadon, who's the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2, Future of Education, and Web 2 Lab Projects. He's our, our mentor and uh, the starter of the Live.Classroom 2.0 show. We thank Weebly for the support of our website. And for all of you who are with us today sharing your ideas and questions, we appreciate your support and look forward to having you come back in the following weeks. So. I'm going to turn back the microphone. We just have a couple more minutes, Ryan. If I'm not picking up myself any questions, but if you saw something or Kim, please feel free to take the mic again and uh, share your answers or questions. Sure, I'll stick around if uh, some other everyone else is sharing. If my, anybody else um, has more um, mutual questions. thoughts, it's been a great presentation, and thank you for being with us today. There was one other question. Ryan, like to collaborate. Um, Somebody, it's a great one, was asking if the students are building the rubrics themselves as part and of their self or ahead, peer assessment. Another question about uh, issues in tech of the classroom, challenges. Um, sometimes they do. We've been, um, after they generate the criteria, we oftentimes will make some for them as well. Um, but I think that would be more meaningful to them. I don't know, are we having a lag in the, in the sound? Kim, are you still hearing me? Yes, I am. I think the Lorna, you might be having the lag. But uh, go ahead and continue, Ryan, about the um, students using the rubrics. Um, oftentimes, after they generate the criteria, 
um, they will be part of that process, but um, for the most, we will provide them with rubrics and peer assessment sheets based on the criteria that they generated. Okay, because I know sometimes that that helps when they're giving input. Um, they really seem more excited about some of the activities. Absolutely. Um, Emily asks, what are some of the challenges you've encountered using the uh, tech activities and devices? Um, I think we've been lucky at Hillcrest because we've got an administration that's been very proactive and supportive of everything that we've been doing. So, I, and, and I know that other schools might not have the same amount of technology or even support. Um, so I guess we've, we haven't been faced with too many uh, other than some infrastructure problems where the networks weren't uh, working at the speed that we would have liked. Um, and with increased uh, mobile devices that are coming into the school with all the students, it does uh, wear on the network, so it does slow down a bit. But we haven't faced too many hurdles yet. And that's good because that speed is a big issue when dealing, especially with middle school students. <laughs> if any of you dealt with the middle grades, um, you know what I'm talking about. But that happens with any level student an adult. Um, and you know, assessment is always a tough topic to discuss and to uh, put into practice effective ways to assess our students that aren't just, you know, paper, pencil, A, B, C, D kind of tests. So absolutely. We applaud you for, you know, incorporating various ways to assess students and even more so when students are part of that process. Oh, thank you. Um, and I, I, we have found that the combination of educational technology and the big six practices of formative assessment or assessment for learning have been unbelievably um, powerful for our students. Yes, and I'm, I'm sure the framework helps you know, guide you into the, the direction of the different areas that are really essential for assessing students effectively. If we've missed a question, we would love to have Ryan answer your question. Uh, go ahead and type your questions in the chat. Um, we can also give you the mic if you'd like to take the mic. Just raise your hand and we'll be happy to do that as well. And a question was just posted, do you have recommendation for sites or resources for using technology with younger students. And before I pass that off to promote the four C's, uh, one that I just found is Byteslide, um, Byteslide.com. And I'm not sure if it has the S. I'll check for the actual link. It's uh, creating um, slides online, but they give you some little uh, graphics that you can use to put uh, for the students to drag over on the slide. And then I'll go ahead and let um, Ryan answer that question. Um, there are a few teachers at my school that have been um, incorporating the four C's of 21st century learning into their practice as well. Um, and they've been doing the daily five. And I also believe Karen Learman, who was uh, in the chat a little while ago, she has a, there we go. <laughs> Um, Betty just posted that. Thank you, Betty. She has uh, her own personal blog and class website, and she has a lot of amazing resources that you would be able to access uh, from there. And you could also add her to uh, or follow her on Twitter as well. I know she's quite active on there. And she's, yeah, very active with us as well. And I believe she's presented for us too. And those are some yeah, additional uh, examples. I believe she has. Yeah, she's great to work with. So, and she has some great ideas. So, you'll definitely want to check out her her blog and see some of the strategies she has put into play as well. Um, I I just uh, saw a question. I just scrolled up, and yeah. Amy was asking if there's a website to go over the six items for uh, the six big practices uh, of assessment for learning. And I know if you 
Google um, assessment for learning and the name Ursa Jensen, uh, you'll you'll get a lot of things that pop up. That Black and William article that's in the live binder and in the slideshow um, is a great article to start with, and then branching out from there, and probably incorporating all six practices into your teaching right away would be too overwhelming. Um, most teachers are already doing aspects of it already, um, but just playing around with one here and there would be a good idea to start and then gradually um, incorporating all of them into your practice. Uh, I think uh, that's how I did it anyways. Um, also, I know right. Chris, we, we, her name. We, oh, sorry, go ahead. I said thank you for typing her name. I wasn't sure how she spelled Ursa. Oh, no problem. Um, and then I know uh, another local teacher, there it is, Betty, thank you. Chris Weider has a good summary of uh, the big six practices as well. He's also on Twitter. Awesome. Okay. Yes, and there are many, many more apps like Nearpod is a mobile device, is an app for the mobile device that you can set up, um, including questions where they can draw or have to write out an explanation um, on the device. So that's another um, alternative as well. I agree, Terry. Near, Nearpod has quite a bit of a, has a lot of potential. Um, I also ju I just read uh, another question about collaboration. Um, our administration really promotes collaboration amongst the staff, which has also really helped uh, all the teachers and students to learn from one another. Uh, I work with How do you share your idea? Uh, we work with uh, I work with a group of five other six or sorry four other six seven teachers and we all have combined classes and so we've actually set up a time once a week to meet so that we can do the sharing um, and we meet every Thursday morning. Uh, before school starts, and we share ideas and things like that through uh, shared documents on Google Drive. Oh, that's interesting, Terry. Now you put the um, the artwork online, and I've been using um, and working on this app called Subtext App, and late, and I want to do a, a fuller ex. Um, ex Exploration and explanation on the app later on, but it's um, only for the iPad right now. They're working on an Android, but you can annotate PDFs and EPUB and eBooks um, subtext with questions and quizzes and so forth within the document that the students can answer, as well as you could share among your colleagues, like. Um, during those meetings, like you mentioned, your collaboration meetings, Ryan. So um, uh, that's another thing that you can check out. I'll have to look into that. Um, yeah, that was, I just found that at TCEA a couple of weeks ago. Uh, okay. Um, also, for other staff members, we have a uh, Tuesday morning Tech Talk. So we do Tech Talk Tuesday so that if any other, if any teachers have any questions or want to go over uh, something that they'd like to do in their class or something they're just curious about, they come and then we go over things with them. Awesome. What time does your school day officially start? Uh, 8.40. Oh. When do you all get out? At the end of the day? Uh, probably 4-ish, around 4 o'clock. Yeah. Oh, the students okay. themselves, they... The same. The end of the day is 2.37, officially. OK. And then every teacher will um, leave at a different time. And Emily's asking if you could repeat your um, about the Tech Talk Tuesday morning, Thursday morning sessions. Sure. Um, Tuesday mornings, we have Tech Talk Tuesdays. And that's just for other. T 
teachers who are interested or maybe who haven't actually taken that step to start a class website or to use the iPads with math manipulatives. Um, and we'll sit there with them and help them out so that they can get a better understanding of how to integrate it into their classroom. And it's open to all teachers in the school. And hold their hand, walk them through the process. Yeah. Those are um, on his campus, live in person. They're not recorded or anything. So, yeah, just for his colleagues. I could start recording them if you like. <laughs> uh, yeah, and put them on your YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I'm sure that you know teachers everywhere are gonna want to access those different things because they all have similar questions. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I could tell you a little bit about what we have in our classroom. We've got a projector, we have an Apple TV, uh, a MacBook Pro, an iPad, class iPod, and we have the students take pictures and we'll take pictures every now and then and if we go on field trips or any event that we're doing we can actually document the learning and have the parents actually see what's going on through a Yeah, did you um, hit your mic button off by chance, Ryan? Okay, we lost Ryan. He'll be back shortly, um, hopefully. But those would be great ideas for him to implement um, and post on his YouTube channel if he's able to do that uh, using the different Mac uh, devices that he has in his classroom as well as Welcome back, Ryan. Thanks. I just got disconnected there for a second. Yeah, that happened. You had just finished saying how you have the Mac um, iOS devices and the mobile devices. Do you have a class set that you can check out or use of iPads or mini pads? Uh, yeah, we have a uh, card of iPads that are um, available most of the time uh, for the intermediate classes and then we have uh, other resources. We have one card for the learning commons and then two for uh, a couple of other grades that they're doing um, book club projects with. And we've, we've uh, been able to obtain these uh, different resources through various grants. And do you teach all subjects or a particular subject to your grade 6 students? I teach all subjects except for French. Okay. And band. Yeah. Okay. So it's like an elementary setup. That's right. Okay. Yeah, okay. so the elementary school that I'm at is uh, K to 7. Okay, it's an extension of that. I see. And are uh, there any it, other it questions seems... before we let Ryan go for the day? Um, let me. Uh, See if I can find your contact information, Ryan. I don't know if we had a slide with just your contact information, but um, okay. There's the, there's your email, and here's the live binder and the blog and his Twitter information that you can always contact him through that information as well. And um, you can contact him through on Twitter as well, or any of those other ways, Twitter, Instagram, his uh, um, class information. And you can connect. And are you interested in collaborating with other schools? Absolutely, yeah. If anybody's interested, feel free to contact me. And I'd, I'd love to you know, do some cross-blogging with your class or anything that you might uh, want to do with us. Have you implemented the use of Edmodo yet? Uh, we have Edmodo. We use it a bit for collaborating with other teachers for the Global Read Aloud, but we don't use it uh, with the students because we've kind of created our own little social network with uh, everything we've been doing with Weebly and with uh, mm. Gmail. Yeah, your blog setup and stuff. 
So that would be great to collaborate, whether it's Skype or blogging. Um, I know students really get so much out of that. Absolutely. Yeah, that could definitely be something in the future about how you set up your students and give them permissions. And um, if you can give us access or share the link to your permission form, that would be great. Sure. So we can add it to the live binder because I know okay. people are asking about that. They're always interested in what others are doing to accomplish that task. So thank you so much, everyone. We will um, be back next week at the same time, and Peggy will be joining us. She will. Um, she's at Ed Camp Phoenix today, facilitating some of those sessions and coordinating some of those events. And we will be talking next week about Scratch and the teacher who uses the an acronym Stretch. So uh, you'll want to tune in to find out what that's all about, and join us for another wonderful session. And be sure to look in the live binder for the nomination form for nominating another educator for our monthly featured teacher sessions. We, we really enjoy these sessions and learn so much, um, whether we've attended the live session or the recording. Uh, so again, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today during the live session, as well as staying on for questions afterwards. Have a great weekend, everybody, and we will see you next Saturday at the same time. Take care, everybody. See you then. Bye-bye.